The Bitcoin Standard Podcast brings you seminars from Saifedean.com, my independent online learning platform where you can take my online courses on the economics of Bitcoin and economics in the Austrian school tradition, join our two live weekly seminars, and read my books before they are published. Sign up now for access to the draft of my forthcoming economics textbook, Principles of Economics, and take five full online courses based on my books, The Bitcoin Standard, The Fiat Standard, and Principles of Economics. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CrowdHealth. CrowdHealth is the Bitcoiner's answer to fiat health insurance. If you listen to the show, you've probably heard me rail against the problems of modern healthcare and health insurance. CrowdHealth is a brilliant new solution to this problem that leverages the power of Bitcoin to help people get affordable healthcare. CrowdHealth holds its cash reserves in Bitcoin. It negotiates with healthcare providers on your behalf and gets you much better rates by offering to pay them cash upfront without having to go through the expensive bureaucracy of modern healthcare insurance. It's a solution that works better for healthcare providers and for patients by disintermediating large insurance companies who have the wrong incentives and are constantly raising costs. I'm very happy to have signed up for CrowdHealth and I'm really excited to support them as they disrupt the fiat health insurance industry. Go to joincrowdhealth.com and use the discount code SAFE, S-A-I-F, and you'll get the first six months for $99 only. Coinbits. Coinbits is a great way to introduce your pre-coiner friends and family to Bitcoin. Get them set up in under a minute and help kickstart their journey by turning every day's pair change into Bitcoin. This Bitcoin-only app takes the uncertainty and fear out of Bitcoin saving by rounding up debit and credit card purchases to the nearest dollar, then using the difference to buy Bitcoin. Set it, forget it, and let the app automatically tax your high-time preference spending by saving the hardest money ever. Want to save in Bitcoin faster? Customers can multiply their roundups up to 10x or adjust their savings frequency for weekly or daily Bitcoin stacking. Coinbits is built on a sound, tried and true dollar cost averaging strategy that turns Bitcoin's volatility in your favor. Once you've gotten a private wallet set up, Coinbits encourages you to withdraw your Bitcoin to your own private wallet and embrace the Bitcoin standard way of life. Start stacking on coinbitsapp.com and save your time and energy in the soundest money ever. The Bitcoin Standard Podcast is brought to you by CoinKite. CoinKite are my favorite makers of Bitcoin hardware. They produce the legendary Open Dime, the first Bitcoin bearer asset, as well as the reliable cold card hardware wallet, the excellent stainless steel seed plates for storing your seed phrases, and the block clock. Now, CoinKite have produced the SATS card, a card the size of a credit card which can store Bitcoin and works great as a gift. CoinKite have just produced a limited edition gorgeous Bitcoin standard SATS card, which carries the Bitcoin standard logo, and you can get it from coinkite.shop slash Bitcoin standard. Use the code Bitcoin standard to get 5% off your purchase. Get paid in Bitcoin regardless of who you work for and regardless of who is paying you. All thanks to a premium service I personally love and use, and that is Bitwage. Thanks to Bitwage, I receive my books royalties in Bitcoin. It is cheaper, faster, and easier. It is a true set it and forget it system, and Bitwage has been offering this premium service since 2014. Anyone can sign up and use it right away. No restrictions or limits, fully non-custodial. You can even split your incoming payment, get part in Bitcoin and part to a bank account you specify. It could not be easier and I cannot recommend Bitwage highly enough. Go to bitwage.com and sign up now and get paid in Bitcoin with your next payment or salary. Hello, welcome to another episode of the Bitcoin Standard Podcast. Our guest today is Alex Gladstein. Alex is the Chief Strategy Officer of the Human Rights Foundation and the author of Check Your Financial Privilege, another excellent Bitcoin book that was recently released. And he's also published very recently an article which we're going to be focusing on today, which is called Structural Adjustment, How the IMF and World Bank Repress Poor Countries and Funnel Their Resources to Rich Ones. Alex has joined us in this podcast before in one of the first episodes. Him and I had a debate moderated by Stefan Levera where we discussed uh, the topic of democracy. Today we're going to discuss an even more depressing topic, which is the topic <laughs> of the financial institutions that practically take the majority of the world's economy as uh, debt slaves and trap them in debt programs. It's something that I discussed in my book, The Fiat Standard, and something that Alex also discusses in his article and his book. So I thought this would be a good opportunity to discuss this and uh, to get Alex's uh, perspective on it. So Alex, thank you so much for joining us. No, thank you so much. And um, you know, actually our first, the, the previous conversation we had on here is very relevant because I think this doing the research for this piece really changed my mind on a lot of things. You know, my background has been working for a nonprofit that helps people who live under, you know, what we consider our authoritarian regimes. So 
one party states, military juntas, etc. But when you kind of get into the financial fabric of the world, you start to understand that, you know, a lot of these dictators are there because they are supported by and sort of bailed out by the uh, sort of dollar system. And at the same time, you kind of see this age old um, dynamic of, you know, poor, poorer, weaker periphery nations being being repressed by, you know, sort of imperial powers, which, of course, you know, has been the case throughout history. Um, that's kind of been hidden, I think, in the last 75 years by all kinds of factors. But it's really no different at, at its core. And that's what really I started to wake up to as I was doing this piece, especially. I still think the work we do is uh, so vitally important, in large part because, you know, not only do the folks who live under dictatorships you know, not have any compassion from their rulers usually, but they're also not going to get any sort of, you know, authentic compassion from the West because in many ways the West requires an arrangement that uh, disempowers them and, and disenfranchises them because it wants uh, essentially free reign over their territory. But I, I thought that that was an important thing to say at the outset. Yeah, no, I think I uh, agree. Tell us first about your book, Check Your mm -hmm. Financial Privilege. Give us a little bit of a summary of the main ideas that you discuss in it and then how that led to um, the development of your thinking on this topic. Yeah, so again, my, my career's been in civil liberties work globally. Um, we at the Human Rights Foundation, uh, organization founded by people from uh, autocracies, Venezuela, uh, or, or collapsing states, uh, our president's Lebanese, our founders, Venezuelan, our chairman's Russian, etc., most of my colleagues are from places outside of the do dollar um, bubble, we'll say. And um, very early in our work, we, we convene a conference where we kind of gather dissidents from around the world. In our second gathering, Julian Assange was a speaker, and I met him in person. And this was in 2010, right after he released the collateral murder video. And, you know, we stayed in touch with Julian, did a bunch of things with him in those first few years. And um, of course, uh, later that year, <laughs> Satoshi's last uh, public post was uh, related to WikiLeaks, where they basically said that they were worried about the Bitcoin project attracting sort of undue attention if WikiLeaks started using it. Satoshi obviously later um, disappeared from public correspondence and then even from private correspondence a few months later. And then in June 2011, we all, we all saw Julian Assange post a Bitcoin address to the WikiLeaks account. Now at the time, we had no idea what Bitcoin was, and we thought it was kind of strange, but it flagged my attention because quite clearly it enabled him to continue to do fundraising, even though the U.S. government didn't want him to. That was interesting to us. And a a as a nonprofit, we, we can, these, these little incidents kind of continued to pop up. A couple of years later in 2013, um, some Ukrainians reached out to us who were organizing against Yanukovych, the formerly corrupt ruler who eventually they tossed out. And they were like, hey, we, we, our accounts are compromised, our bank accounts. We want to do a fundraiser. Will you help us? Will you, will you do a Bitcoin one? And we were kind of like, Bitcoin, really? But uh, we tried it. And hey, it worked to our surprise. It worked just fine. I mean, the price wasn't very high versus the dollar, but the thing worked really well to get money where it needed to go without the state's permission. So we kept seeing this stuff over time. And then in 2017, I was like, I've seen enough. Uh, spring of 2017, we started to do actual programming where we connected activists to, to people in the Bitcoin community. And we've been doing it ever since. But basically, because of my insight into the global human rights uh, network, into all these different movements in all these countries, I, I started to see Bitcoin being adopted. And I learned from all these people. And um, you know, I tried to write a book that did two things that number one, charted the rise of global Bitcoin adoption through the eyes of a handful of people in different countries. And at the same time, added some insight to the existing, the, the status quo. Like, what, what, why do we use the dollar for everything? And what happened over the last hundred years politically to get us there? Because I think if you understand that, it helps you enormously in terms of what to expect, let's say, over the coming century. Um, so yeah, the book is really a story of um, global Bitcoin adoption and also uh, you know, maybe the peak and maybe the the the, the future potential demise start start you know let's say erosion of of the dollar system. So it's part testimony, part uh, sort of monetary um, history. Yeah, and I think you know I I appreciate the book very much because it's um, it's it's quite useful to have this to show to people because it's it's astonishing how many people think Bitcoin is just a bunch of uh, Silicon Valley tech bros. 
and you know meme stocks and uh, people just gambling on it and perhaps it's understandable that you might see that impression because if you live in the US or in Europe when you hear about bitcoin you're hearing about it in this context you're hearing about people uh, you know you're hearing about people who are speculating on GameStop and uh, US treasuries and uh, S&P 500 and all kinds of other uh, volatile uh, shitcoins um, <laughs> they are getting in and out of bitcoin and talking about price movements so it can be tempting to just dismiss it as yet another uh, digital toy and of course most people like to just dismiss things rather than dig in and so one of my favorite genre of tweets is when your random american or european blue check journalist is um, fine you know the price of bitcoin has gone down a little bit so they want to score some internet points so <laughs> they start making jokes about how oh bitcoin bros um gambling not going so well this week and uh, this just proves that bitcoin is useless bitcoin is pointless what is the point of consuming all this electricity when it doesn't do anything it just allows a bunch of um, tech bros to gamble and I you know one of my responses is to tell them uh, look Bitcoin allowed me to save my family from hyperinflation in Lebanon um, what are you doing with all the electricity that you are consuming yeah. you're making snarky stupid jokes on Twitter with your blue check but beyond that <laughs> what have you actually contributed to the world maybe we should stop you from wasting electricity because you're not doing anything near what Bitcoin is doing so your book is quite useful because it uh, tells those people to check their financial privilege you know they uh, they live in a world in which they have access to all kinds of gambling instruments they think their monetary system is fine they don't they've never lived under a functioning monetary system to see what it would be like uh, they think it's normal that they need to gamble and all of those things in order to just maintain their purchasing power but they they have no idea how much more urgent this is for people in other parts of the world so what are some of those ways in which uh, you have found it most uh, helpful and useful well, I mean, and, and I think that the, 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 the piece that we're going to discuss today is, is kind of the ultimate form of financial privilege because people in the West, or at least in the dollar system, you know, they believe or they're led to believe that, that their governments are charitable towards the global South, um, when in reality, <laughs> the financial privilege is, is, is such that underneath they are actually taking advantage of these poor countries and, and, and that's being sort of advertised as, as assistance. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that, but um, the, the book and the writing that I did over the last few years definitely led me directly to this piece. But as far as having, yeah, I mean, I mean, look, all these critics that you mentioned, I mean, they'll never accomplish in their whole lives what Bitcoin does every day for people in, around the world, especially, you know, in broken economies and in repressive states, it's really a lifeline. And I want to be somewhat uh, open-minded and I want to be optimistic. I, I think that a huge percentage of people just don't know. And, and I think that it's, it's such a weird alien radical thing, Bitcoin, that like it, it, it takes some time to comprehend. This was certainly the case for me. I mean, I was very skeptical for a long time, even though I was confronted by a lot of evidence of people using it. So I want to, on the one hand, be somewhat um, empathetic towards uh, an understanding towards what I would call pre-coiners. These are people who just don't know any better. But then there's a certain breed of people who know better and who continue to to sort of attack and deny. And those are the no-coiners. And yeah, I mean, they're 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 going to have to change their mind eventually, um, and they're going to hate it. Um, but they're gonna they're going to be forced to. It's just the reality. And I think when I sit down with any mix of these people, uh, what I like to do these days is is bring friends who have used Bitcoin in their, in their life, you know, to, to, to improve their lives. And I, I like to bring them in and have them explain, you know, so that it's not me explaining it. Right. I mean, I'm just, you know, some random white American kid, right. From the U S of course I have a human rights background that makes me a little different than like someone who runs a Bitcoin exchange, but it's much more powerful for me to be able to bring friends that I've met in the last 15 years and have them explain. Like I learned from them, so I want them to teach everybody else. And I think that's the greatest thing I can be doing out out here is using the connections I've made in my in my in my career uh, to help the world see what's happening. And that's that's what I continue to try and do. I've sat down with policymakers, let's say in Norway last year. These are important people. I mean, these are former ministers, senior leaders of cabinet stuff. I was in a room with about ten of them, and then I had about ten people from the Bitcoin community who were from all over the world. And we just kind of went around the room and we were doing introductions. And 
these people just, their jaw was like on the floor. When I had someone from Nigeria, she was explaining how the Nigerian government went after her bank account when she tried to fund protests against police brutality. And she's like a part of a feminist coalition and, and, you know, defying every single like kind of caricature of what, what a Bitcoiner is. Right. And she's like explaining coolly and calmly how vital it was for her and her colleagues. And, and these people were just like that you could just see it. They'd never even comprehended this before They're uh, as Dr. Sue says, their puzzler had never puzzled this before. Right. Like they're, they just had never even thought of it. And, and you know what, it was disarming. And, I think pretty effective. Like, I, listen, they, they might continue to be skeptical of Bitcoin, but they're going to know. They're going to know now that people use it. It's it's very und, it, it's undeniable. If you're like a an intellectually honest person, and you spend a little bit of time now talking to people who use Bitcoin, uh, you cannot deny its utility. And I think that's what's different from five six years ago, where it was harder to 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 kind of make that connection for people. You could be um, forgiven for being skeptical in 2016. I, I completely agree. Maybe you weren't you weren't right, but you I could forgive you today. I cannot forgive if you're some economic expert and you're continuing to deny the utility. It's just you're you're burying your head in the sand. Yeah, and of course, a lot of these people do that because it's not just the failure to understand. It is also self interested. I mean, correct. Um, there's there's no escaping the fact that what we think of as an economist today is largely a fiat job. You know, you, if you call yourself an economist, you are almost certainly, um, pro the probability is much higher than 90% that you are getting paid by a university that is primarily financed by the fiat money printers or by a government agency that is primarily financed by the fiat money printer or by, or by an international agency that is primarily financed by the fiat money printer. Or if you're in the private sector, you're almost certainly in a financial institution that is also financed by the fiat money printer. All these organizations either get direct subsidies or low interest rate loans or preferential treatments from uh, the fiat system. You know, whether you're uh, Citibank or uh, JP Morgan or Goldman Sachs, that's not a free market entity. They've been bailed out repeatedly. They have access to lower credit rates than everybody else. They have primary dealer licenses for the treasuries that allow them an enormously uh, privileged position in market making around the world. So this is not a free market institution. This is an institution that is there because of the money printing. And so when you calculate, you know, when you look at the economists that populate these institutions, as well as the universities and uh, the uh, government institutions and the international organizations, then uh, there's, you know, these people know where their bread is buttered. They know where their money comes from, and it comes from the fiat money printer, and Bitcoin takes that away. And so for them, it's a matter of trying to find the reasons for why their very basic, almost instinctive uh, level of hatred, which is this is going to take away my candy. You know, I live off of this candy and this thing is threatening to take away my candy, which is free printed money. It's just their their brains exist primarily to try and find reasons to justify their instinctive reaction. And you can't really blame them. I mean, they are parasites effectively. They would not have these jobs in a free market. And it is in their interest that this parasitic institution continue to exist, that they're able to continue to take resources from uh, society at large, from productive people through the money printer without having to produce value. And so I don't blame them for continuing to come up with stupid reasons for yeah. why Bitcoin and can't work. One other note on that, as for the people, the vast majority of innocent people who, who are not parasitical, the problem is when, you, when you're presented these days uh, with whether it's crypto or blockchain, in the overwhelming majority of cases, your introduction is not unfortunately your book or a 2015 Andreas Antonopoulos video like it was for, for some. Usually it's like Brian Armstrong or, or SBF. Like that, that, that's like when people get kind of an intro to Bitcoin, you know, any sort of Bitcoin, blockchain, crypto, any sort of buzzword like that, that's unfortunately who they're talking to. Like when, you, when you're thinking about policymakers on Washington and of course, like the more, more powerful ones are, are, are going to be anti because this threatens them. But the ones who are careerists who may be open to it, like they're not sitting down with like activists who've used Bitcoin or people who've used it to save. <laughs> they're sitting down with, F with, with SBF, you know? So the world is being colored by people who run crypto, unfortunately. And it's, it's, I saw the same thing happen five years ago with, with blockchain in the humanitarian space, like in 2016, 17, 18, 
everybody in the humanitarian aid industry or development was led to believe that blockchain was the answer and they needed to create their own blockchain for to help refugees or whatever. Uh, in fact, one of the most uh, prominent cases was a refugee camp of Syrians, I think in Jordan, actually. It's in the first chapter of um, a, a book written by Michael Casey called The the Truth Machine, actually. And it's just all this nonsense about like putting people on the blockchain. And that's what you know so many people were led to believe. And I think it's happened, unfortunately, it's happened again five years later with each hype cycle. Now it's been like Web3. So all these organizations that may have well-meaning ends, Save the Children, for example, and we, we could criticize them, but like, just let's say maybe they are well-meaning. They have a Web3 operations lead now or something like that. And, and it's, it's the same thing over again. They're getting distracted from Bitcoin, which could actually really help their operations. And I just think this is just going to keep happening. You know what I mean? It's 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 sad. Yeah, and I think you know the, um, the, the, the this this was a lot more sad when I was uh, uh, when when I was the gold bug because when you're a gold bug, you know you sort of had to rely on the idea that you needed to convince people to vote in a certain way so that they would then have politicians who would reinstitute the gold standard. And it's just right. I, I think that 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 hack can't be fixed with this uh, w with this kind of defensive mechanism. I mean, the system is uh, just. It, uh, fiat is like a short circuit in the working of a civilized society that prevents that kind of resolution um, to it as a problem in that fiat pays for the propagandists to continue to keep people confused and fiat pays for the people to uh, prioritize their short-term benefit at the expense of the long-term good. And so that's that, that, that's the dilemma out there. And I think the great thing about uh, Bitcoin is that it functions without anybody's permission. It just continues to operate internationally. Anybody can use it. And so, um, <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, Nouriel Roubini has been going on about Bitcoin having failed when it, Bitcoin was uh, $58. And <laughs> nothing Nouriel has ever done in his life. You know, he's never called the trade or he's never earned anywhere near as much money as he would have earned if he'd just been DCAing Bitcoin since he so confidently said that it was um, such a failure. I mean, if he'd, uh, if he, if he'd been an Uber driver and he started uh, DCAing into Bitcoin, he'd be in a far better financial position than whatever he's been doing for the IMF and all these other criminal organizations yeah. to pay his uh, paycheck. I mean, there's, there's four kinds of people who remain in denial about Bitcoin. There's like the salty hater types like him who... They're just jealous or they, they, they're kicking themselves because they, they should have invested a long time ago. Then there's the people who are like uh, chartalists, basically. Uh, they really don't like Bitcoin because it breaks their worldview of how money is. They think money is Caesars only and they don't understand that it could be something that's not created by the state. That's not something that they can comprehend. Third, you have lazy intellectual people who just don't want to put the work in to understand it. They wish it would go away. And then fourth, you have people who are invested in a competitor, you know, in an altcoin type project or whatever, and they they need to sort of criticize Bitcoin to promote their thing. I would say that virtually everybody who's out there attacking Bitcoin these days falls into one of those camp categories. Um, so yeah, we know where where Rubini is, that's for sure. Indeed, absolutely. Let's dig into the kind of people who pay these economists salaries. Uh, in particular, I think the most significant force for fiat on the global stage is the IMF and the World Bank. Those two institutions in particular, they do a lot of promotion of fiat money globally by basically offering it as loans for governments. And that incentivizes governments to become short-termist in their focus and to want to take the uh, easy money now because it allows them to achieve all kinds of short-term uh, goals that otherwise seem completely unattainable um, by deferring the cost into the future. So what is, what is your take on what these organizations do? Yeah, well, thinking, hearing you say that, at a very high level, you can think about it as almost like monetary colonialism, where post-44, post-Bretton Woods, post-creation of the dollar regime, you, you had a group of people who wanted, to, who wanted to promote the dollar and the dollar system and the fiat system and the credit system that's inherent to it. And what I'll sort of describe in the essay, and, and we can talk about here, is over the following few decades, they figured out a way to like basically export that system to every single little corner of the world. And the world didn't function that way before that. Like there wasn't as much reliance, nearly obviously as much reliance on 
whether it be fiat or credit, you know, that sort of way of thinking and doing business and living. In many cases, that was like unknown to a lot to vast parts of the world. They had their own indigenous models and systems that were very, very quite different. And the brilliant sort of devious success of the dollar system was to like, essentially like penetrate all these places and all these nooks and crannies around the world and then flood these places uh, with with this like credit, which was, you know, presented as your only way to save yourself or it was presented as somehow affordable or the right thing to do or the wise thing to do. And in reality, it was it was a trap. It was a debt trap. And that's that's kind of what has happened to, let's say, what, what used to be called the third world, or we could just call the global south for, for the purposes of, of this conversation, which really means anyone who is outside of, we'll say, the US, the former British empires, like top colonies, like Australia, Canada, uh, the e what is now the eu japan and and, and then we'll we'll leave we'll leave the soviet former soviet union and, and china aside but but basically everyone else will will include in the global south which is about 80 percent of the world's population and they have the absolute majority of the world's resources um in terms of what makes civilization tick they have the raw ingredients and they have the labor uh they have the overwhelming amount of labor you know this is interesting i mean if we if we start like at this level you you can almost see why you go back a hundred years, you, you can start to see why some of the stuff that Marx talked about was so intoxicating. Because what he was describing went not like let's say domestically at the level of the worker and the state, but internationally, where, where I think Marxism probably had its biggest successes in terms of a movement, in terms of attracting people's um beliefs. We just come off of MLK Day, right? You know, famous, famous socialist. Uh I think the reason why people were so intoxicated uh, by what what Marx had laid out, what his predecessors, uh, or rather, rather what his acolytes um, promoted was, was there's a huge grain of truth to what they were talking about of this sort of exploitation of the, of the third world by the, the global north or whatever. And I think to sell something, you have to have some element of truth to it, right? And that was very smart um, because that was true. And everybody, you know, anyone who, who anyone with eyes could see it if you lived in the, you know, what was called the third world, you could see the exploitation every day of your life and whatever field you worked in, you could see the unfair deal, you could see this new system coming in and taking over. And I think that was a smart move by uh, the international left was to sort of glom onto this and, and it, it, it helped them become a huge force. Um, over of course, time. the reason the reason that they uh, had enormous success, you know, it can be attributed to ideology um, and can be attributed to the idiotic ramblings of uh, Marx. But I think the uh, more obvious explanation, very clearly, is that while they harped on about exploitation and mm -hmm. um, rich taking advantage of the poor, in reality, they never mentioned anything about the money issue. And that's why right. they were so proud that they were so uh, strongly promoted, you know, by the institutions of uh, the imperial powers. I think this is the the, the, the very yeah. um, uh, <laughs> delicious irony that most people refuse to notice, which is, you know, there's nothing in the culture of, uh, say, China or the Middle East or Africa that <laughs> has Marxist ideas embedded in it. These things came from American institutions and British institutions mm -hmm. And uh, the same institutions that brought the central bank. So the reason they promoted this moronic nonsense is because it told people here, you know, there's a, here you go, there's the chip on your shoulder. And the solution is print more money because ultimately the solution to all of these ideas is print more money. And so, you know, if you've known people who've worked for the IMF or the World Bank, the vast majority of them are very left-leaning. And yes. um, the, the, these ideas, uh, <laughs> it's 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 not it's not a paradox. It's very functional. The reason left leaning people are gravitate towards the IMF and the World Bank is because the IMF and the World Bank are very left leaning in what they do. They print money and they let governments centrally plan. And the reason that um, leftist intellectuals, even though that's an oxymoron. Um, the reason the leftist intellectuals get so much funding and so many jobs in both, you know, uh, World Bank and IMF, as well as all these other satellite parasitic institutions, the universities and the think tanks in the third world, is because they promote the money printing agenda. I mean, this is this is, I think, the uh, the, the very obvious explanation. Why is it that money printing is so? 
uh, universally agreed upon because the only people who get jobs are the people who support the money printing. Like you can't have a perspective on economic issues where the solution is we don't print money or we stop printing money. That's just not going to get you anywhere. So that's why the uh, spread of um, Marxist ideas comes from the um, imperial and colonial powers. And that's why it has been enormously, enormously helpful in 21st century colonialism to spread these kind of ideas because um, it, it's misdirection. People focus on, oh, well, we have McDonald's and uh, Coca-Cola and that's American imperialism or they're sending us all these amazing technologies. That's how they're being imperialist. They're exploiting us. But don't pay attention to the money printer. Yeah, I think it's like <clears throat> levels of understanding, right? So because the international left um, for, you know, for as long as it's been around, but let's say for our purposes... Uh, certainly since World War II, because they were like using the banner of exploitation, you know, they ended up producing, you know, some thinkers who who had good insights into this area. And, you know, what I tried to do when I set out to look at the discourse around the bank and the fund was read as much as I could. And, you know, as you note in your book, obviously the most popular pop culture uh, in, you know, whether or not it's true or not, uh, insight into this area is Confessions of an Economic Hitman, which was written by a sort of James Cameron-ish, uh, you know, international lefty guy. Um, and, you know, he touched a nerve because some of what because some of what he was writing was true, is my point. Like some of what these folks write is true and it it um, it captivates an audience, um, whether it be him or Naomi Klein or any of these people like they, they touch on un- uh, or a nerve, right? And and part of it is true. The problem is they don't they don't they don't go beneath the sort of surface level obvious exploitation piece to understand what you're describing, which is the monetary exploitation piece, which they are a part of. However, I was able to learn a lot from a lot of different kinds of thinkers. You know, going back through the history, ranging from libertarians to Marxists to centrists, etc. And I think what emerges is a really, you know interesting narrative, I guess, that that I was able to piece together or that I want to advance at least, which is to say that and it relates to colonialism. And I think that like the 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 rise and fall of what we know as colonialism probably doesn't get enough uh, attention in, in economic um, thinking, just in terms of its impact on the world uh, or like what, what was caused by colonial powers getting defeated or, or leaving. To give you an example, um, in the 70s, we often talk about the inflationary crisis. <clears throat> One reason that the, the that, that happened was was because that the OPEC nations were able to raise the price of oil. Well, that happened because of colonialism getting defeated. Like the, these, these nations now had control over the oil production. They didn't before. The Seven Sisters did, right? So that's like a you know, that's like a direct kind of uh, response to an old system getting overthrown, right? And and yet you never really hear about it talked about like that. So some of these thinkers start to describe how for hundreds of years, uh, you know, Western empires managed to keep co- standards of living higher in their countries uh, and keep inflation down in their countries through through inputs from an from external system from somewhere else. And that would be what we would call the global south. And they would get cheap or free or stolen um, goods or labor from the periphery of the world. And they'd input it into their society um, at art of like what we would think of as maybe artificially low prices. And this allowed them to kind of like subsidize a lot of what they do. And that really ground to a halt uh, in many ways between 1920 and, 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 um, and 1960, which is known as kind of the formal end of colonialism. Of course, there were other colonial powers that, that survived up until 1980, basically it was Zimbabwe, but, um, but generally speaking, 1960 is known as the end. So you had like this drain of resources and cash and labor, et cetera, that the Western powers and, and, and even, you know, Eastern powers were used to, to having access to that really ground to a halt. And, and, you know, you have World War II at the intersection of these two eras. But what I start to notice when I, when you do the research here and you read about what, what ended up happening with the IMF and World Bank is that they were set out to, to, to be, institutions that prevented what happened in the 30s from happening again. This is like the the traditional history of it, right? Like you had autarky, you had competitive devaluations happening in the 30s. Um, so the dollar system engineers said, we don't want that. We need global trade to flow because that's good for our system. So we can't have this like autarkic system going on. We, we need to, we need to have, in, we need to be able to penetrate everywhere, right? 
So initially, the bank was set up as a development bank that would fund infrastructure projects that private capital didn't have appetite for. And that really focused at the beginning in war-torn Europe and Japan. And then, you know, the fund was set up as international uh, lender of last resort for those same countries. And they kind of like existed in that way, kind of, um, you know, for about 15 years, you could say that that's actually what they did. My thesis goes as, the, as they kind of got back on their feet, the, the Europe, Japan, the Western powers started becoming industrially successful again, getting past their late 1930s production. Then that's where you see the World Bank and IMF start to start to become what they are today. And I think this was really interesting because at times exactly was sort of the end of colonialism. Basically, once these powers regain their strength, they direct the IMF World Bank to the periphery, to the global south. And that's where you see these like fiat inroads being made. And that is the the general dynamic is that um, obviously a lot of these poorer countries, you know, they were commodity based countries that actually did pretty well after World War II because they were selling stuff to the powers that were fighting each other. Um, they, a lot of them had a good capital account in the 50s. Thing is, after the Korean War, uh, commodity prices tanked. Um, and a lot of these countries, they didn't have leaders who were very responsible <laughs> with, let's put it that way, with the with the war chest they had um, built up and uh, they ran out of money. And at that point, the world was was transformed into a dollar world. So money meant dollars. They didn't have any. So they had a lot of import export crises. So the IMF was like delegated to go deal with that, right, to go fix that issue. And all of a sudden you started having the IMF bailing out all these countries in the global south with dollar denominated debt and this started this started we this should say i, sh yeah, I, I should say here like a, a lot a lot of this i i don't have exact numbers on the mm -hmm. ratio but i think a lot of the countries they were first uh, they first got into these crises because they took on uh, development uh, financing they took on developing yeah. loans that was really and and that initially came from the world bank and i think a, mm -hmm. a key factor here is uh, fiat economics and uh, modeling Generally, whenever there's a catastrophe in modern uh, fiat world, there are some uh, some university nerds with models, uh, whether it's in epidemiology or in climate or in uh, development. And so in the 1950s and 60s and oh, until today, the World Bank would go in and do some uh, sophisticated modeling uh, with state-of-the-art uh, computers and uh, show the people in the country how, well, if you just borrow this amount of money from us, then you're going to boost economic growth by this much, and that's going to increase tax revenue by that much. And then um, that's uh, going to lead to more economic growth and all of these uh, development metrics that you care about are going to be a lot better. So why don't you just go ahead and borrow? You know, it's basically risk-free as, uh, as we've learned in the crypto world. And a lot of countries got into that debt uh, in the 50s and in the 60s on the, uh, ba on the basis that this was basically risk-free. Because 50s yeah. and 60s, it was generally a low interest rate environment. The, yes. US was, the US was exporting the dollar all over the world. And, yes. it could, uh, and, and the, you know, they'd, uh, in the 40s, at the, end, uh, at, the, at the end of World War II, um, one small little detail which most people don't like to think about, the world moved a big amount of its gold to the US. So about uh, all of those central banks that were in the IMF and the World Bank, basically all the free world, that's what was called that time, the free world, they got in to Bretton Woods by handing over a chunk of their gold reserves to the United States. And at that time, one ounce of gold was worth $35. And uh, they got $35 in exchange for that. And then the US um, got a big chunk of gold. And so then um, they were giving away dollars and getting gold and they could make as many dollars as they want. Yes. So as you would expect, they started making more and more dollars and they just needed a way to get these dollars into people's hands. And the best way to do that was to lend them out well, through the IMF and the World Bank. And gold plays an important part of this story because what you're describing is, again, for the folks listening, like 50s and 60s, not only did you have like US policymakers trying to export the dollar, but you also, as you say, had the World Bank like offering all these loans and it being sold as like the way that you're going to develop as a country. But what's important to understand is that to to get a World Bank loan, you have to join the IMF first. It's like a precondition. This is how the system was set up. And until the 70s, uh, there was a, a stipulation whereby 
when you when you join the IMF, you have to deposit a certain amount of uh, value with the IMF. That's the point. It's like a pool of capital that you deposit up front, and then later, if you have a crisis, you can draw down. You can draw. You can draw from it. You know, a certain amount. And when you made your initial deposit as as a sovereign state, you had to deposit twenty five percent of it in gold. So par- part of what was happening was <laughs> was actually uh, the the West. Uh, extracting a lot of gold from a lot of these countries, um, which was, you know, which is, of course, interesting, uh, because today they continue to hold that gold. It's a huge amount of gold. I, I detail the exact amount in my piece. And yet, it's as about you 3000 tons, it's, uh, yeah. if they were a country, they would be maybe the second or the third or the fourth largest gold reserve. So the US is number one. And then the IMF has <laughs> roughly about the same amount as Germany, Italy and France, who are like uh, second place, basically. And, and, and yet they and they're very careful. They I think they sold a little bit of it uh, recently, um, but they're very careful about conserving it, which shows you how much they value gold. Uh, and also- Yeah, I mean, they <laughs> bought it at $35. Let's remember. I mean, they bought it at $35 from your government, dear listener, wherever you are in the world, your stupid government gave the IMF gold at $35 well, an ounce. Uh, well, or, they, or it was just given as part of the, it was the deposit to entry. It was the entry fee. Exactly. And, and the, other, the other piece though, is that as you've noted, they've never been, countries that are part of the IMF aren't allowed to go back on a gold standard. So it's, it's exactly. just sort of this huge double standard. But anyway, so the point is that you had all these countries that, that wanted to get World Bank funding for their, and again, most of them ruled by unaccountable leaders who didn't really have like this low time preference. I mean, most of them were high time preference thinkers. And they were like, yeah, let's get a giant hydro dam. We can get fat off all the contracts around that. So this is a kind of that you know, the ideas that were permeating and the, and the behavior that was permeate, permeating in the global south in the 50s, 60s, and up through the mid 70s. Um, and, and it, you know, what was happening was actually, you know, a flow of resources from what we would call the the, the west or the north to, to the south. This was true for, a, for quite a while. For those first few decades, there was, in fact, an outflow. The thing you have to remember, and which apparently is like completely forgotten in development economics, is that is that when you make a loan, the borrower has to pay back principal and interest, right? So uh, these World Bank loans especially were like long-term loans. So they were like 20 or 30-year loans that could even get, many of them got deferred through a mechanism called the Paris Club, which is a place where um, countries would go to like kind of get a delay or a renegotiation so they could pay it back even later. But whereas IMF loans were like initially short-term, two to three-year those would some of those would get delayed, but the World Bank loans were like very very long term. So what would happen is like these countries would initially experience an infusion of cash uh, as they got the loans, and then 10, 15 years later, all of a sudden they they're paying out more to the World Bank than they had borrowed. Like so, the cash flow reverses. And if, if you see a chart of this, I have it in my uh, piece. It's it's kind of striking. Like twenty years after you take a loan from the World Bank, you, it's like deeply negative. Like you're paying back a lot more than you borrowed. It's it's you can think of it this way: if you borrow a hundred million dollars for a project, the taxpayers of your country probably end up paying back one hundred fifty million or more in the end. So what we forget is that often we forget that the fact that the bank and the fund are not um, charitable institutions. They make money. Um, they make money off a few things, but mainly the global Cantillon effect, like like they have access to cheap, cheaper dollars at the source, which which can be had for lower interest rates. And then they 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 borrow that capital at whatever three or four or five percent. And then they loan it out to the global south at seven or eight or nine percent. Uh, this is like one of the key ways they 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 sustain themselves. Yeah, well, I, uh, I'm just, just going to quibble with one thing you said. You said yeah. the $100 million loan, um, by the end, they'll be paying back $150 million. Uh-huh. Um, if, you, if you look, actually, there is no end. <laughs> right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, theoretically. The, the, yeah, the, the loans don't generally get paid off because what ends up happening is that the government is going to default and then it's going to need to sign a restructuring. Correct. And then the debt gets rolled over, so yeah. it never quite dies. So what ends up happening is, let's say you borrowed $100 million, and then um, in a few years, you owe um, 95 of them, let's say, and you can't pay and you're bankrupt. So then you sit down and you renegotiate a longer term loan with structural adjustment policies and all kinds of control um, handed over to the IMF and all kinds of privileges handed over to the IMF's corporate sponsors. 
And then the $95 million loan gets, say, renegotiated into, let's say, a, uh, an, an $80 million loan and rolled over, but then you take another loan for $40 million, so now you owe 120. 100%, yeah. Yeah, and so then the the numbers continue to grow, and uh, you, <laughs> well, let me give you let me give you a number. Done. I'll give you an example, and this is true. If you look at the external data of the third world or the global south, it's an exponential chart. And you know, the WTF happened in 1971. Site, you know, really should have some content in this area on there because it really is striking. But essentially, especially after we go into the pure fiat world, for example, a country like Bangladesh had about $100 million or so of external debt in the early 70s, which was a lot, but like, man, let's call it manageable. Today, they have $100 billion. Okay. So that's that's the like extraordinary increase in external debt that, that the process to which you described ends up trapping these countries in. So essentially, what I, what I, the, the piece that's important to get to is that like, this was happening in the 60s and 70s. So all of this debt was being was flowing out and these countries were were uh, sometimes in the like in the black in terms of what they had on, on hand. Like they were they were they were getting money and they were spending it somewhat sustainable because, as you, as you say, the the the, um, infl- the the rates were relatively low. It was like a relatively low interest rate environment up through the, you know, let's say the mid 70s. What was happening in the 70s, though, was two things. So there was a uh, the head of the World Bank in the 70s was probably the most influential head of either institution ever uh, was Robert McNamara, who used to be the the Secretary of Defense of the United States. So he went from being the guy sending 500,000 troops to Vietnam and dropping bombs on Southeast Asia to, to dropping debt bombs <laughs> on the third world, uh, essentially. But he he realized that like to sustain because a lot of people were like, wait a second, a- after 71, they were like, there's all, all these newspaper articles in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal from the time about this. They were like, wait, why does the IMF still need to exist after 71? Like this doesn't make any sense. And and people were questioning the World Bank at the time too. So to like sustain these institutions, and again, the bank and the fund are the same building in Washington. They're connected, like they're very kind of tied together there. They're closely coordinated. Uh, it's not like one, you you can say one is evil and one's not. They're, they're, they're really part of the same thing. So McNamara says to his colleagues over at the IMF and, and, and to his colleagues at the bank, like, we need to grow. We need to like rapidly expand the amount of lending we're doing. Because what was happening is some countries were even like India in the 60s, for example, was paying its loans back. Like they were they were like paying off what they had borrowed. And, and this was like a problem, right? For these people that, that wanted to keep the debt party going. So what started to happen is that you had a massive bubble in debt to the third world by the late 70s, by like 1980. Like McNamara had convinced both the World Bank and the wider development and assistance world. Like remember, the World Bank often funds a project and is the deal maker. Like they'll go in and do 40% of what it costs to do a dam and they'll get a coalition of a bunch of other people. The local government will put up 20% and then they'll go find a bunch of other private banks to, to put up the rest. This is like kind of what the World Bank does. So by yeah, the, I should. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sorry to keep interrupting, but I think yeah. a, a, a bit of necessary context here mm-hmm. is that the reason this really ramped up in the 1970s is because the 1970s was when fiat inflation took off, and so yes. in the 1960s, the IMF had a big pot of gold that they could lend against, and they were connected to the Federal Reserve. But the Federal Reserve had a limit to how much money it could create because the dollar was redeemable in gold for mm-hmm. global central banks, at least in theory. But then when the 1960s, in the late 1960s, when the US printing started getting out of hand and these central banks tried to redeem the gold, the US had to suspend redeemability. Yeah. So then with the redeemability suspended in the 1970s, monetary policy went wild and interest rates declined and the US government was financing all of its operation. You know, basically the, the famous idea was that we can have bombs abroad and bread at home mm-hmm. because of our great genius monetary policy. And of course, what that meant was also tons of money available for banks, international yes. banks and large financial institutions. And these people needed to get that money out of the door and to find somebody to borrow. And that's where the World Bank and the IMF really um, mm-hmm. step in by finding basically third world deadbeats who will take on that debt because at that time, yeah. interest rates were very low. And people thought, of course, um, as always, like uh, 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 Keynesians always think, you know, this time is different. Um, we've actually discovered alchemy and alchemy works. So they go into this thinking, yeah, well, we're going to always have low interest rates. It's the new normal. And uh, these countries need to take advantage of it so that they can build all of these important projects for their development. That's how they get into a mountain and, of debt yeah, in the 1970s. And, yeah, and there's there's a few other, I mean, if you think about it, like the 20, you think about the, the 1920s stock market like bubble or the 
uh, internet, the dot com bubble or the subprime bubble. This was this was even this was in some some kind of if you look at some metrics, this was even bigger. I mean, this was like a massive sovereign debt bubble. And you had, again, because the bank and the fund are like steering the ship, you had the whole industry lending out loans to these countries. So by like 79, 80, <laughs> you, there's some absurd percentage of like US domestic banks that that had some sort of third world loan on their balance sheet. You had people in Nebraska, get, I mean, it's crazy, giving out loans to countries in the middle of Africa and South Asia and Latin America. Um, and, and, and you know, you use the term deadbeats, but it's true, like in the late 70s, 18 of 21 countries in Latin America were dictators. Um, so so they, they <laughs> like straight up dictators. So, you know, these people had no permission from their, not, not that any government really does, but they, they had, they weren't even interested in having a conversation with their population about borrowing. They just did it right away. And they used a lot of it on palaces and, you know, exotic sports car fleets and whatever. So you had this wave of debt coming in, and it was also amplified by one other factor we should mention, which was petrodollars. So, I mean, these the, the OPEC nations had this massive amount of, of dollars they were earning, and they were parking it at banks, and those banks were like, hey, we need let's make some money here. So that they, they, were, they were also being steered by the bank and the fund to lend those out to all these countries, Brazil, Argentina, et cetera. So you had a lot of factors gearing up to a giant bubble, basically, at the end of the 70s, early 80s. And this would precede what we know as the third world debt crisis, right? So this is when the bubble popped. So basically, by that point, the people who ran the fund in the bank knew that this was a Ponzi scheme to the classic sense of the word. Like they knew that the only way this could keep going was with more debt. The only way that these countries, as you described, could possibly pay back the initial amount of debt was with more debt. And that's what's been the case ever since. So it's been a Ponzi ever since, you know, the 70s. And what ends up happening is uh, domestically, the United States gets into a crisis with the dollar, which has, in, you know, uh, matters for domestic politics, electoral politics. So they bring in a guy to raise the interest rates of the world reserve currency very, very high from whatever it was, 8 to 10 percent, all the way up to close to 20 percent. So this uh, this devastates all these countries. So they start to default. So Mexico in 82 kicks off the crisis by defaulting. And the thing here is that's important to note is that like in many cases, bankruptcy is good for capitalism or it's like a healthy part of capitalism. Like you, you fail. OK, you, you move on. Right. That wasn't allowed to happen. So the system was set up so that these countries weren't allowed to, to go bankrupt. OK. And in a large part, it's because all these banks that the World Bank and IMF had had gotten into the party. All of these loans to these third world countries, it's important to remember, that loan is an asset on their balance sheet. They don't want to write that down. They don't want to, They don't want that going to zero. They would much rather just give another loan and grow their entire balance sheet. And that's what was happening here. You start to see it supersize in the 80s. So you had Mexico go down, but instead of literally going down, they just got another bailout. And you start to see this happen again and again and again whether it was Latin America in the 80s or Asia in the late 90s or the or Europe in the 2010s or all countries during the lockdowns a few years ago, you know, two years ago. This has happened and each time it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the important thing to note is that these loans, it's not just that they're high interest and it's not just that um, it becomes a burden on the population. The, the, actually, the title of my piece is, is called Structural Adjustment, something we haven't mentioned yet, and it's something that's super, super important. It wasn't just enough to, for the West to trap these countries in, in debt traps, um, which would create a flow of resources back to, the, back to them. Um, they wanted to actually engineer these societies so that they would create stuff that we wanted. Um, and that's what Structural Adjustment was for. So I don't know, maybe you want to give your take on it first, and then I'll, I'll call it. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll add one small, uh, well, not small, <laughs> pretty, I think a significant point is that these things are presented as third world bailouts, but in reality, they're not bailouts for the third world. They're bailouts for the large Western financial institutions Correct. that are making those loans. So, uh, you know, the citizens of um, your average deadbeat IMF borrower are not the ones in trouble because no. the government is in debt. It's Citibank that's in trouble. Yes. It's Citibank that's sitting on tens of billions of dollars of um, tin pot dictator <laughs> bonds. No, and I, and I have a chapter on this in my essay and people, I mean, you might want to check this out in there, but like it is shocking the percentage of U.S. banks that had exposure to the third world in the 80s. Like, like, it, and you read the text. Like I sat there and I read actual I, quote unquote IMF history written by the IMF and they're not like, I mean, they hide a lot of stuff, but they're also pretty 
frank about why they did this. Like it was because these Western banks were going to collapse. Like there was going to be a end of the world 1930s style uh, crisis in the Western banking system if these countries weren't bailed out with new money. That's what that's that's the reality, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's it's similar to the dynamic of this, um, you know, the, the mortgage-backed securities and the subprime borrowers in the U.S. and the housing market collapse of two thousand and eight. Uh, the the real victims of that market correction would have been the large financial institutions that underwrote all of that stuff, and so you know as you said bankruptcy is a, is is a, is a normal part of capitalism and in a world in which we have something closer to a hard money mm-hmm. governments that borrow irresponsibly like this go out of business and the borrowers uh, sorry the lenders who gave them that money are also <laughs> going out of business or getting severely getting severe haircuts because of it so if you're a citibank and you're out there lending to african uh, despots or latin american military regimes that take the money and build palaces and sports stadia and um, buy luxury sports cars with it you're an idiot lender and you deserve to lose your money and your shareholders deserve to get wiped out and your management deserves to get fired like this is this is how it would work in a normal sane capitalist system you lent billions of dollars to somebody who misused them you don't get to have another go at lending more billions of dollars and if you do anybody who gives you yeah, money and is, uh, deserves it so in, in 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 a truly capitalist system that problem is to a very large extent self correcting because you know governments go out of business and they 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 you know either they're replaced with a regime that completely repudiates everything that they did and starts on a footing where they are able to deal with the rest of the world while maintaining res- financial responsibility or you get taken over by a government that can be financially responsible. You know, your neighboring country that is responsible, they will have the soldiers to take over your country and the citizens will welcome it in many cases because they'd rather be managed by somebody who's responsible. You know, replace this horrible king who got into debt to uh, build palaces with a foreign king who's going to be better off at it and is going to tax us less and run the country more responsibly. There there were serious consequences to defaulting on debt when money was hard, when nobody had a printer. But now you're borrowing from Citibank and the Federal Reserve and these foreign governments and they have money printers. And Mm -hmm. so when you fail at paying them back because you're a deadbeat uh, third world leader Mm -hmm. and you're not going to pay them back, you get replaced with another carbon copy because what you're doing is very profitable for them it's not profitable if you get wiped out and you can't pay them back and they go bankrupt then that system is not working but as long as you continue to do engage in this then it is very profitable for them and so what happens is they are going to give you more structural adjustment programs and more loans and extend more credit lines for you and they're going to if you're going to be replaced by somebody they're going to bring in another puppet who's going to take on another IMF. One more thing before we get to actually what is structural adjustment, the the, the moral hazard here is is really um, significant because what you can think, the IMF and World Bank, actually what they are in some case, you can basically think about them as insurance for Western companies to go into these, you know, uh, sketchy places or whatever that, you know, they were having board meetings in the 60s and 70s and 80s, all these companies. And they were like, well, do we really want to go into this country? You know, maybe in a normal world, they would have been a little more prudent about and careful about what they were doing. But because the IMF and World Bank were acting as a backstop, as a guarantee that they'd get their money back, like that they'd get paid back first, you had just a completely, uh, basically a, a, a lending on steroids movement because the banks and the companies knew that they'd be made whole by the bank and the fund if anything happened. And this has led to just this like absolutely staggering amount of, 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 of lending. So there's a little bit of this sort of moral hazard insurance thing. Does that make sense involved here? Oh, absolutely. This, this topic obviously is the uh, focus of discussion in chapter 11 of the fiat standard, which is uh, titled Fiat States. And it discusses how the uh, global monetary system allows these international organizations to continue to entrap these countries in debt. You can find the whole essay, the whole chapter, chapter 11, you can find it on my website. You could read it for free on safedeen.com slash fiat states. And the link will be in the show notes as well on safedeen.com slash podcast. And the key idea here is that these organizations function 
in a world of zero accountability. I call them the misery industry because that's what they do. They are in the business of um, promoting, prolonging misery and benefiting from it and profiting from it by mm-hmm. using it as an excuse to print money because this is a very, very lucrative way to get the fiat money printers to run. You know, um, if there's a crisis in a country where people are hungry and starving and there's uh, a humanitarian catastrophe, well, wouldn't it be a good use of our printer to give those people more money? You know, most people are decent and they'll think, well, you know, let's just run the printer and then we'll stop other people from uh, starving. And um, But in reality, you're creating the incentive for the promotion and for the propagation of the misery because there is no accountability involved in the operation of these organizations. Mm-hmm. They are not paid in order to reduce misery. They benefit and structurally the way that they finance themselves is through loans. It's through issuing more fiat loans. The way that this industry works is that they need pretexts for getting more loans. And the key point, I think for me, uh, the, the, the key, key point about how they operate is that they face no serious budget constraints. These are not financial institutions that have to uh, meet. No, on the certain- contrary, they're often like, you guys need to spend all this money. And they're like, oh, my God, like you had all these bureaucrats in the, in the 80s and the 70s saying, oh, my God, like, how are we going to spend two billion dollars in Zambia? like or, or whatever like and they were forced to, to to finance like projects that were never going to help anybody except for the sole purpose of plunging that country more into debt you know yeah because it's a, it's it's a supply driven phenomena there's a supply there's an infinite supply of fiat money that's being handed over to these organizations and they're told you know find misery and throw these dollars at it because the cost of capital for these organizations is practically zero it's it's close to zero so the the key point to understand uh this issue which i mentioned in in in, uh, the fiat standard is that ultimately you know if the imf needs to make a 50 billion dollar loan to brazil next week because brazil is in trouble they don't need to go like any regular bank they don't need to go and figure out how are we going to raise 50 billion dollars how do we get investors to get $50 billion or how do we, should we call in some of our other loans to let's say Argentina um, and South Africa and India or whatever so that we can take some of that money and give it to Brazil? Um, Should we cut down on our expenses or should we sell out one project that we have? No, they don't have a real cost of capital. It's an entirely political decision. If the US government is happy with Brazilian government, then you're going to get those $50 billion credit line extended by the IMF backed by the US Federal Reserve. If the US government is not happy with the Brazilian government, then that $50 billion is not going to come. Yeah, and I, yeah, I mean, well, the investors are the the <laughs> Americans and dollar users who who don't have a say in in what happens uh, with their monetary policy. But essentially, like to set the stage for like what the IMF does to these countries, again, like you had these powers, these empires that were used to this drain of resources coming in to help subsidize their way of life, and and that was like kind of ended uh, by the the end of colonialism. Um, and you know, I don't know if there was like a bunch of guys in a smoky room who like figured this out. I mean, it doesn't matter, but the, the outcome structurally of what has happened is that ever since 1982, as, as we were talking about before, ever since the really, really strong rise in interest rates, in the United States forced uh, a lot of defaults in countries across Africa, South Asia, Latin America, the, and then all of a sudden there had to be restructurings uh, and the debt they owed was a lot higher. So ever since 1982, the flow of funds ha- has permanently been from the South to the North. And that's something I just didn't know before doing this research, which is quite crazy to me. And it, it, it got, it started out as like a couple billion dollars and now it's, <clears throat> it's in the trillions. So for example, in any, well, I'll give you a year that I, I looked, I just have on reference, like in 2012, if you think about all the money that flows from the North to the South, investment aid, uh, income, all that stuff, remittances, it was about uh, 1.1 trillion or so, like went from the north to the south. Uh, but that same year, 3.3 trillion flowed back. So we've we've figured out, whether it be intelligently or as a structural outcome thing, how to replicate the drain that we used to have when we used to just like go to these countries and steal stuff. That That's kind of what, you know, realized and I think we need to acknowledge about our way of life here in the West is that it's heavily subsidized by 
uh, taking from other people. It unfortunately is a little bit of a zero sum game, sadly. And, and again, it's not just the loans themselves. It's the fact that the IMF and World Bank exist essentially to, to impose, essentially wage deflation on these countries. Like what, it's not enough to take the resources cheaply, which they do. What's, what's very important is to make sure that the workers who produce the stuff that we need are not paid nearly as much as ours. Um, and, and the average worker in these countries earns about 20% of an average worker in our country, in our countries. This is sort of, as an American speaking, that's kind of the way it is today. So that's kind of how the system has operated. I don't know if, again, I don't know if there was a conspiracy or not. It honestly, doesn't matter. That's been the outcome. And the the way that's been achieved, again, is not just through what we've talked about so far, this crazy amount of lending and all the factors that led to the lending and what the lending does to these countries over time. It's also the way that these societies, these economies get shaped. And that's really what structural adjustment loans are. So again, if you're Argentina in the 70s and you're taking a loan from one of these institutions, um, especially the IMF, and then after 19, <clears throat> around after 1980, the World Bank started doing this a lot too, was instead of just being like, like the World Bank previous to the 80s, like all of its loans were like very specific to a project or to a sector. But after that, they were much more like just general uh, money that could be spent, however, uh, with 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 certain kind of uh, requirements. And this is what the IMF has always done. So the IMF would give a bunch of money to one of these governments. The government could spend it however they want, including steal it if they wish. In fact, a lot of these governments stole 20% off the top of what was given to them um, for their own private you know, mansions and palaces, whatever. But the point is that like, in order to, to, to draw the money down from the credit line, from the standby agreement, you had to do a certain number of things that, that the, the creditors wanted, the creditors of the IMF and the World Bank, which were the G5, right? Japan, the United States, France, Germany, England, like you had to do what they wanted. And I just have a list here of like, I, again, reading like, like just dozens of texts and books and things on the topic. I, I kind of, I chose 10 that I kept seeing, uh, and these will be immediately uh, uh, recognizable to anyone who's ever lived in, in uh, the third world, right? So the first one, and the reason why this conversation is so important, Safe, is that it, what happened in the early 80s is happening again right now, right? So you're seeing a rise of interest rates, you're seeing a collapse in all these countries in the third world, and you're seeing the IMF come back on the world stage as like a big factor, right? Whether it be right now in Egypt, whether it be right now in Pakistan, whether it be right now in Ghana, whether it be... Uh, right now in Ethiopia is a big one. You know, first piece of the IMF playbook is currency devaluation, right? And you're seeing that right now. So Ethiopia apparently is going to have to agree to maybe a 50% devaluation to take to take these these bailout loans from the IMF. We've already seen in Egypt um, massive devaluation attached to the to the loan, and in Ghana, which is preparing for another structural adjustment loan. The Ghanaian currency lost 60% of its value last year. Um, so you see this over and over again. And, and one reason this is done is because it makes the exports more competitive. Like the IMF and the World Bank and their creditors, they look at these countries as, as companies, basically, and they need to reduce expenditures and increase profits. And, and one way to do that is to make their raw materials exports you know, as competitive as possible. And, and they, like re regardless of any other factor, that's like that's key. So Currency devaluation is number one. Feel free to interrupt any time or we can just review them. But uh, number two would be like a total reduction or abolition of foreign exchange and import controls, which, you know, might make sense in some, it might make sense, except for the fact that the countries imposing these structural adjustments never abide by these themselves. Uh, America and all these rich countries have crazy amounts of foreign exchange and import controls. Um, number three, shrinking of domestic bank credits. So they're, they're basically causing a recession, right? Higher interest rates. Number five, more taxes, an end to any subsidies on food and energy. Again, might be smart from an from like a philosophical economic point of view, but it's not like in this structure, it's not in theory. In practice, what happens is the rich countries continue to subsidize their food and energy for their people. And this happens overnight in these poor countries. So people end up starving. You have wage ceilings, you have restrictions on like healthcare education subsidies, total like incentives for multinational corporations, favorable legal, legal conditions, and then selling off state enterprises at fire sale prices. So it's a mix of like stuff that like makes sense and some like theoretically makes a lot of sense. And, a, and, and it's also a bunch of things where you're like most Bitcoiners would be like a gas dad. But for, even for the things that make sense, like if you're if you're a libertarian and you, you believe in like a smaller state as being more effective, 
this is not how it plays out. Like w- the reason why it's so unfair and problematic is because the wealthy countries that impose the structural adjustment on the poor countries, they are relentlessly protecting their own economies with planned measures, with subsidies, with tariffs, et cetera. So these poor countries have to like liberalize essentially. And it's not a level playing field. Um, I don't know, you, you've talked about this, but you know that's that's structural adjustment. So what it does is it squeezes a country, forces the wages down, and gets as much out of it as it can to international markets. Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know the, the 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 pernicious thing here is that they give free market policies a bad name because you know in reality, yeah, you should be removing subsidies on goods in order to have the markets function. You know, if you wanted people in the country to have access to fuel. The best way to do it is to have a free market in fuels. And the same is true for bread and the same is true for all of these uh, essential commodities. Simply keeping subsidies for these crops is just going to cause inefficiencies, a lot of waste. It's going to cause a lot of people to be able to exploit the system for their own benefit. It's going to cause all kinds of different complications that we see happen everywhere. The problem, of course, is that they use this as the Trojan horse through which they get in more debt. The problem is the debt and the inflation. And so get rid of the debt and the inflation, and then you don't need any of the subsidies, you don't need any of these um, supposedly pro-poor measures. Because you get into debt and you start printing money in order to finance government spending, that all leads to the destruction of the economic system. I mean, and I think and this is something I discuss in the FIAS standard. I mean, ultimately, you know, the, 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 the kind of Keynesian economists who get paid from promoting this debt, which is practically all the fiat economists, uh, they look at this from a delusionally optimistic uh, perspective where they think, hey, we're going to give this government $3 billion and then this government is going to spend those $3 billion and that's going to cause GDP to go up by $12 billion over the next 10 years and that's going to lead to more than $3 billion uh, in tax receipts increase. And so the entire thing is profitable and they'll get hospitals and bridges and first world infrastructure. But that's not how this works. Economic central planning does not work in rich countries or in poor countries. All that you're doing, well, I mean, you're doing two things. First of all, you're getting the population in debt, which is catastrophic. But even worse than that, you're giving the government enormous amount of power to centrally plan the economy. So if they just take the debt and stick it in the president's Swiss bank account, this would be better. I mean, it's theft. I'm not saying it's a good thing, obviously. Obviously, I would prefer that they know not get the debt in the first place and not print the dollars to lend to them in the first place. But if you did do it, it would actually be better if the president would just take it all and put it in his Swiss bank account because then domestically in the country itself, the economy of the country is undistorted. Whereas if you give the president and his political party and his cousins and his friends and um, all of his cronies those $3 billion, you've basically made them own the country. You know, if you're talking about a country where the GDP is something like $10 billion and then the president has $3 billion to spend in a loan, well, they're going to have an enormous amount of power over the entire economy and they're going to cause an enormous amount of inflation. And the way that they're going to try and get the inflation um, to be accepted by people, the way they're going to get people to sign off on this is by mandating these completely unsustainable, insane price subsidies for essential goods. So, okay, inflation is going to go up, but don't worry, gasoline is going to still be affordable, bread is going to be affordable, and all these basic staples that you need are still going to be affordable because we'll subsidize them because we are great. Well, they can't keep subsidizing them forever. Eventually, they're going to have to lift the subsidies and you're going to be stuck with the inflation. So, the sad thing is, the IMF and the World Bank then come and say, oh, well, we'll give you more debt, but you need to remove, and, and they never say remove, they always say restructure the subsidies. Yeah. And then, you know, so that we can hide the future inflation with more and new different kinds of subsidies. Well, and then you can take you for an, to, the same ride to, all to, over again. To, to your point on like, it'd be better if they just stole the money. I mean, that's why it's important to understand there's like three levels to what's happening here. The first level, again, as we covered, is just the debt itself. It's just the fact that these countries are, are 
are going into these debt traps that they can't pay back. They earn in they, their native currencies are fiats, which are which are very weak over time compared to the dollar um, and the, the, all the debts denominated in dollars. The second thing is the squeeze, which I just described, which is the way that these loans, in order to take them, you have to agree to certain conditions which squeeze your economy. And the third thing is dependence. This is actually really key. So it's, it, since 44, it's been like a primary objective of the US government and of the EU and you know these rich countries to 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 be depend to be independent agriculturally and to make other countries depend on them agriculturally agricultural policy is driven like so much of the world and um you know you have this situation today where like in a pure free market africa would probably be like a breadbasket for the world it has just incredible agricultural terrain and it's like the perfect place to grow a lot of things but because of these structural adjustment policies and because of these these loans and because of the way the world bank would come in and say no you can't grow food for consumption you have to grow like peppers or shrimp or something that we're going to eat over here, what ends up happening is that these very like, very like um, fertile uh, breadbasket type regions, equatorial regions of the world, they're all food importers. So crazy. So the continent of Africa today imports 85% of its food, which is just mind blowing. And essentially like Again, this is because of what we've all described, but it's also because of the, the tariffs imposed by the West. Like basically, if the, if the West just lifted its agricultural tariffs like today, it wouldn't have to do any more aid ever again. Like that would be like that's that's kind of it. Like we protect our farmers so much with fiat subsidies. It's completely I mean, you know, we do it for national security reasons. I understand. Um, but that's the way sort of the world's worked. So one outcome of this stuff is that all these tropical regions, which are so good at growing things, have been kind of repurposed away from food that the people eat and sustain themselves and be independent towards stuff that we eat or we want. And it's usually, what's, what's really twisted about it is it's usually inedible stuff. So stuff they can't even consume locally. So it'd be like cocoa or tea or coffee or rubber or palm oil. I mean, this is the stuff you see, you know, all across the the sort of equatorial regions, which which constitute most of the borrowing countries here. Um, they've been engineered away from cattle and rice and and chicken and and the you know foodstuffs that they use to sustain themselves tr traditionally in the Arab world. Um, olive oil, uh, different kinds of indigenous grains, like that's the World Bank would come in and say, no, 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 you need to do this something else. You need seed oils or whatever. Like they would literally say that this literally happened in like Morocco and other other Arab countries. So you'd have these like bureaucrats come in and say, here's all this money. And no, you can't like do what you want to do with it. You have to you have to like give us food and things that we want. And then when, when they weren't messing around with agriculture, they were doing resource stuff. So like a classic example of like a World Bank funded project would be something with like bauxite, which is, uh, you know, a mineral that's refined into a different, different other kinds of metals. So you'd have a country, uh, Mauritania is a good example, like that had a bauxite uh, reserve that was discovered by the colonialists, right? So post-colonialism, uh, the, the World Bank would come in and make a loan to make a mine in the middle of the mountains and then make a, tra a, tra a train system to, to get this, the ore out to a port and have it just sold to an international market. So that's what the loan would be borrowed by the country. So the taxpayers of Mauritania would be paying for that. The crazy part is there's something called a double loan. So like the, the World Bank led consortium makes the loan and, and with that money, everything is built to, to ferry the resources out of the country. The thing is, who builds the, the railroad and the port and the, and the mine? Western companies. So the West gets paid back twice. And then the, the taxpayers of this country have to pay back principal plus interest. And they don't bet, they basically don't benefit at all from what's being produced, which, you know, is all being absorbed by a little bit by their local dictator usually. And then the rest is just by internationals. And that's, that's what's called development. And that's what's so infuriating. Yeah, I think a, an important point to keep here in mind is if you think of economics from the Austrian perspective, which I think you should, uh, because it's the only coherent way of understanding economics, I think it becomes clear that it's not just that, you know, corrupt people take their cut. The problem with those projects is simply that they are unworkable. They are not profitable. They are not projects that people would invest in. Again, the entire premise of these loans usually is that, oh, well, we have a market failure where the market won't invest in building this um, outrageous uh, train tracks to take these um, rocks, uh, 
pro processed from a plant in the end of nowhere um, all the way to the seaport and then to ship it abroad. You don't get private investors wanting to do that. You know, there are highly advanced industries in the West and all over the world that invest in those things. You know, there's Chinese miners all over the world, investing mm -hmm. all over the world. And they put up their own capital and they invest it and they take the risk to do those projects. Well, if they're not investing in your countries, in, in this incredible project that the World Bank is telling you you should invest in, there's a very good reason for it. It's not a market failure. It's your failure of understanding the market. The good reason is usually that this project is likely not going to be profitable. So there are people who understand the aluminum business and they understand that if you're going to be processing this metal over there, um, given the conditions, given the fact that this place has no experience in it, that you're going to need to import all the um, infrastructure and all the engineers and all the designers and given all of the risks involved and given all the potential ways in which this thing could not work, it's probably not worth investing $500 million into making it work. And that's why on the market, nobody does that. Maybe that's better. Maybe it's better not to invest that just because you can come up with an idea where maybe this thing will work. Yeah, well, you could also buy a lottery ticket and maybe it'll work, but maybe it won't. So should well, do you go and you punt on every potential lottery ticket? No. And similarly, most of these projects, they should not be financed. And then the correct. World Bank presents the fact that they're not being financed as being a failure of the market that the World Bank is going to yeah. fix. But yeah. in reality, they're just getting you into debt for something that's highly well, risky. And if it has a chance of working in the private sector, it's going to be much harder for it to work when it is run by a well, central planning authority. What's key is that um, net, these projects, correct, are inefficient. They don't make any money. But they're done in a way where like somebody benefits, right? So I'll give you an example. If you've ever seen a map of West Africa, you've seen maybe a country of Ghana and from, from a map or from space, you can see that it has this huge lake called Lake Volta. So this was a man-made lake created by the Aksumbo Dam, which was funded by the World Bank in the 60s. And the reason why it was, was financed was not to help the local population. It was so that like uh, an American company could get really cheap hydroelectric uh, price of electricity to do aluminum basically processing there. And for like its first 20 years, that's that's what it was doing. It, it, and there were there were like villages all around the dam that were not electrified. <laughs> it's like all the electricity was going towards uh, this company that was getting like super below market rates that, that, that again, the Ghanaian taxpayer was subsidizing, like, like as in a whole, the project wasn't making money and it had like tremendous environmental catastrophic environmental downsides like it flooded this whole region all these people started getting sickness from all these parasites like it's the the wreckage was truly ghastly to behold in terms of what it did to the country um but for 20 years this country got like this company got like cheap electricity so so it was profitable for somebody but but certainly not the people who ended up having to pay for it i think is 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 is, is the idea and whether it be these um resource extraction projects or whether it be these agricultural projects that would that would you know, quote unquote, modernize the agriculture of these nations where, yes, 100 years ago, there's no question these countries were extremely poor, but at least they were independent. Like you could grow your own food. Today, these countries are still extremely poor in relative terms and they can't grow their own food. They have to go to the market and buy it in a world where the food is not priced in their own fiat currency that they make wages and it's priced in dollars. So it's gotten dramatically worse for a lot of people, despite the fact that our civilization has advanced so much. And what, where you start to really see this in the numbers is that in a lot of these countries that underwent these structural adjustment policies, like these countries in the global south that took all this money, that continue to take all this money, all, all these loans from the bank and the fund, the, the number of hours that a person had to work for a thousand calories of a particular uh, nutritional substance went up a lot. Now, that, that's, that's, that's the toll of these things is they, they squeeze the worker in, in these poor countries so that it benefits people in, in, in the other countries. So you've got like in Latin America, for example, uh, you know, the, the amount of hours you'd have to work for like a thousand calories of beef or something like that in some cases would like double or triple from like the 60s to the 90s so even though like we have technological advancements and sanitation advancements and healthcare advancements and all these things that technology is improving these programs would like really squeeze these populations and what you end so the so the toll in the end like so there's studies done in mexico which is like a pretty good proxy for uh, a, a borrower of the fund or the bank that countries took a ton of debt from both um, in a country like that, 
the GDP per capita uh, declines by 2%, um, you get like a 1% deterioration in the mortality rate or, or increase in the mortality rate. So if you think about a country of 100 million people, GDP declines by 2%, you get you know a million premature deaths, essentially, something like that, right? So you got to start to think about the fact that between the 70s and 90s, especially, some some cases still today, but basically GDP per capita in some of these places declined by 10, 20, 30%. So you know, the, 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 the result of these policies, uh, of these structural adjustment policies probably killed tens of millions of people. And what's crazy is that that's never talked about. No one will ever go to prison. There's never going to be any accountability and we keep doing it. It's really just, it's kind of, uh, honestly, it's quite depressing and I don't know, you know, there's no, there's never going to be, you know, uh, justice for that. Does that make sense? It's just sad. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. It's, it's it's very depressing when you think about it because at, as you say at these levels of income it's really small amounts of money are a matter of life and death for people and mm -hmm. i think the long-term impact of being stuck in this cycle is has been absolutely devastating um the way that i think about it is this most of the technologies that have improved life in the 20th century they've been around since the beginning of the 20th century the most important technologies that we have think about um, sanitation electricity um, modern infrastructure these things became pretty uh, widespread in the early 20th century and started to spread all over the world. In particular, I should add, you know, industrialization and um, the steam engine and the internal combustion engine and, you know, the use, particularly the use of oil, gas, and coal. These things were, uh, you know, they started off in Western Europe primarily in the uh, 19th century and they continue to spread all over the world. And, um, you know, it's, uh, they, they've, improved our ability to trade all over the world and they started to spread and the impact that they've had on our life has been enormously positive they've made life really much better for people all over the world but it's still astonishing that in many places you still are not able to benefit from these technology for me it's completely insane that there are places in the world that cannot afford 24-hour electricity because 24-hour electricity is just not that difficult of a problem and it's not that expensive. It continues to get cheaper. We continue to become more and more efficient at producing more and more electricity. And yet many people cannot afford it. And for me, I think you cannot ignore the role of fiat in making this um, happen. I think Correct. fiat has been enormously influential in this thing because fiat destroys people's ability to save. Fiat destroys people's ability to accumulate um, savings, which then they can spend on capital goods. And putting people in this continuous cycle of debt is constantly sucking their excess. Whereas instead of saving yeah. and accumulating in order to buy uh, electric generators, which then increase your productivity massively, allowing you to save more and invest in more in capital infrastructure, which increases your productivity and improves your quality of life, you're stuck on a treadmill that's uh, sucking up all of your excess it's going off to pay off the debt to these international institutions. And you're unable to afford these basic technologies, which for me, I think is, is, is criminal. It's, it's, uh, it's been massively devastating for the poor of the world. And it's, um, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that you see that um, the places that got industrialized before fiat primarily are the, are the ones that managed to become rich countries yeah. with very high living standards, whereas the places that got fiat money before they got industrialization have been stuck, unable to get on the path of industrialization. The few exceptions of the countries that did industrialize under fiat you know, the, the, the most striking examples usually given are, say, uh, Singapore, South Korea, you know, the, South, uh, the, the East Asian countries that uh, produced enormous amount of growth in the post-World War II period. Even though they were on fiat currency, what was different in those countries was that they had very high saving rates. Yeah. And so they flew entirely against the conventional IMF wisdom, which is that you should borrow in order to, mm -hmm. the IMF and World Bank wisdom, which is that you should borrow in order to grow. These countries accumulated enormous amounts of savings, and that's what drove their growth. Well, and post-1998 Asian financial crisis, 
uh, one of the re- one of the things the IMF and the U.S. tried to do was break that up, uh, was to change that, was to rearrange that so that they were more uh, dependent on foreign borrowing. Actually, um, it's kind of interesting. Like the if you look at the structural adjustment agreements uh, of the bailout of the debt crisis in seventy in ninety seven ninety eight. One of the reasons, one of the ways that they changed those countries in the East was um, was was to make them more dependent. I want to talk about Bitcoin and how we're seeing like a big a rise of Bitcoin adoption in the countries that have been hit hardest by this. But three other quick points, just just to touch on them quickly, just just to underline, like again, the overwhelming majority of this debt that's been incurred uh, has been by unaccountable leaders, by by like the most comically repressive dictators. I mean, we're not just talking like, well, that guy, you know. You know, maybe no, no, no. We're talking about people who are committing uh, genocide, the, the, the Chinese right, right as they were committing Tiananmen Square, Mengistu while he was killing th- tens of thousands of people in Ethiopia, uh, Mobutu uh, while he was uh, just depopulating the Congo. I mean, we're talking about the worst possible dictators of all time um, received enormous amounts of money and bailouts from the IMF and World Bank. So that's just one thing I wanted to note. And then, and even <clears throat> colonialists. I mean, if you went back to the first few decades of the bank and the fund, I mean, in 47, the bank gave a bunch of loans to the Netherlands, which was which was at that time engaged in a colonial war uh, to try and just keep its empire in Indonesia. And that's what that money went towards. And you you had all kinds of World Bank funds go towards the British and, and other empires to, to try and keep their empires together. It's was, it was really quite astonishing. The second thing I wanted to mention was... Um, <clears throat> the sort of green colonialism thing, the high irony of all the, of course, of all these countries is, of all these Western countries is that in their development, they stole literally or got for very cheap fossil fuels from the periphery of the world. Like that's where they got a lot of it from. And then they use that in their own development as a nation. And now (laughs) we're trying to say not only you can't use those, that's not good for the planet, but also you have to use the stuff that we make instead. So you have to use our renewable, like wind, wind, uh, solar, et cetera, uh, instead. And I find that to be pretty shocking. Um, The third thing is China. I think we have to mention it that the Chinese saw what what the U.S. and the EU did through this, and they tried to replicate it over the last decade. And indeed, pr- right before COVID hit, uh, and, and still sort of today, basically China was lending at a rate very similar to, to what the bank fund complex was doing, almost the same. There's a huge difference, though in that China doesn't issue the world reserve currency. So as you were saying, like they, they, they have more restraints on them. So what's gonna end up happening is like, China's gonna have to start pulling back from some of these countries. They, they have no ability to do infinite bailouts. So they've tried to emulate this as a major power, especially in countries in their orbit. And they've tried to do what we've done as and they say as an American, what we've done. Um, but I, I, I think they're going to come up against limits way, way sooner than than we are. So I wanted to just mention those things before we get to the Bitcoin stuff. That I don't know if you wanted to mention or talk about any of them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, can you think of anything that fixes this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I, w- I mean, I would just say that it's sad because, like, in the '80s in Peru, like you were screwed. There was literally nothing you could do to get your if you're earning income, like it's going to go into a currency that's being devalued by this foreign power. And the things that you need are getting more expensive and more expensive for your family. And that's why so many people died in these countries. And there was no escape. Today, it's, I don't want to like, you know, sugarcoat anything. It's going to be really, really bad. I mean, people, so many people are still going to die prematurely, et cetera, et cetera. You're going to have just collapses in all these countries happening as we speak. The thing is, there is an escape like there, you know, people with a phone can get access to a currency. Um, They can educate themselves and learn about this and do this. And they can put their wages into something that can't be taken from them. Um, And I think that's just super, super powerful. Um, And this is is what's interesting is you see. And we're probably speaking about Bitcoin and stable coins here uh, for the moment, as we still are in the fiat standard. Um, but when you look at cryptocurrency adoption, you know, if you add up Bitcoin and stable coins, they make up like the overwhelming majority of this volume. The, the, the countries that get hit hardest by the IMF over time, whether it be it was like Indonesia, Brazil, Argentina, Nigeria, Turkey, Philippines, like honestly, like the, the top in the latest data that I've seen, the top seven countries, seven of the eight top countries in the world that have the highest Bitcoin or cryptocurrency adoption are countries that have have 
been sort of targeted by these uh, IMF and World Bank loans over the years. So it's interesting to see that people are kind of fighting back and um, it gives me optimism. And I don't think there's any way Satoshi could have predicted. I, mean, I don't think he was thinking, he was thinking about this. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, it's such an interesting outcome of, of Bitcoin, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think Bitcoin is like a double punch to this system. On the one hand, it allows the victims to opt out where you can, you know, if you live in a place where the government is destroying the currency because they're engaged in um, insane inflationism and central planning, you can opt out by putting your savings in something that does not get devalued over time because nobody can inflate more of it. And so it's like to hold on to its value. Second, I think the, the, the longer term way in which it fixes this is that ultimately this entire circus only runs because of the money printer. This entire circus only runs because of the dollar printer that allows the IMF and the World Bank to continue to operate with zero regard for budgetary restrictions or fiscal responsibility, where they can just continue to issue loans infinitely to anybody who will take them, anybody who's careless enough to get their country into more and more debt. So people all over the world, I think, are going to um, benefit enormously from the collapse of this money printer because if you take away that money printer, then we live in a world of hard money again. There was no IMF under the gold standard. There was no World Bank under the gold standard. There are no supposedly benevolent institutions going out there handing out loans to economically unprofitable projects just in order to make those projects work or in order to bail out fiscally and monetarily incompetent governments. In a world of hard money, if you're going to be lending to one of these governments, you need to put up your own money. You need to take money away from your use. It has to have actual opportunity cost to you. Fiat destroys opportunity cost. It allows these organizations to lend out money that they don't pay for. You know, they, there is no opportunity cost for the IMF or the World Bank for every dollar that they lend. It's just money that's sitting there. And the more excuses they come up with for lending, the more money they get. And it's interesting to think about like, yeah, like for individuals, you know, we have an escape. Like, and I think that's fascinating and I mean, incredible to follow. We'll see how it affects like the nation state system. But what what is interesting to note is that, you know, when the World Bank and IMF were created, it was still a sort of a pseudo uh, gold standard system in a way, right? Like, as you mentioned, like until, you know, through the late 60s, they were sort of limited. I'm not saying that, that the World Bank and IMF couldn't exist in some form in a Bitcoin standard. Like, it is conceivable that nations could pooled together capital to, to do things like this. Um, it, the, di the vast difference, of course, would be that th these infinite bailouts would be impossible. The loans would have to be much more prudent and there'd be a lot more skin in the game from the depositing countries, from the creditors. Like They'd be a lot more interested in the success of the actual projects to make sure they're profitable. And it would just look very, very different. But I, I, it's, you know, it's not that I don't, you know, there still could be a sort of, you know, lender of last resort slash develop, you know, world development bank it's just like they would have way less influence and they'd be a lot more prudent and and you know what i mean like it's it's not it's possible they could still exist but i have a feeling they'll <laughs> they'll probably go the way of the dodo but we'll see yeah i mean uh, th there will be lenders of last resort people can use their money to bail others out if they find that there's a business that's in distress and you think there's a compelling case for bailing them out right now to keep them operational because you think in the future their cash flows are going to be positive then you know that's an entrepreneurial field of business and i believe that will exist under a hard monetary standard but the key thing is you'll have to put up your own money or convince people to willingly put up their own money in order to operate that and so that has a far shorter fuse for <laughs> bullshit, basically well it's and I, going I to think be much more difficult to continue to uh, to finance somebody like mobutu sisseko with a hard money. exactly but i think you mentioned this in your in the, the writing about the misery industry but um the, the sort of comparison to the that as an addict so like I, this is the, the biggest tragedy of all is that because of the system and the way it was designed you know the, the debt is like a drug right so the the world bank and imf essentially are like the lead uh, drug dealers and debt is the drug and these developing countries are are the addicts and, and no one no, no one wants to stop the party like there's no incentive to stop the party uh the, the unaccountable leaders can continue to borrow and if they're in a dictatorship it's all good. And if they're in a democracy, they end up just pushing it to the next regime. Um, no one's no one's telling them to stop. And and the creditors are making money and, you know, basically shaping the world. They don't want to stop. So 
there's no one here to like be a therapist and say, hey, maybe you should stop taking the drugs. Maybe you should try this instead. Maybe you should try to reduce the amount you're taking. And I think in a fiat standard, that's just the way it goes. And you're just going to have like essentially like when like the outcome is death. I mean, the, the really big outcome here that goes unsaid is that lots of people die in these poor countries as a result of this system. Um, so if you have a hard money standard, if you have the Bitcoin standard in the future, uh, I do think um, it, it's sort of like the therapist who comes in and changes things. Uh, and, you know, the sad part is, you know, if you're in one of these countries that's on the brink um, or is collapsing, like, yeah, it's a dilemma. Like, Every life matters, right? And hey, maybe an influx of capital today saves a few lives. But that's the most traumatic sort of tragic thing is like people have to make those decisions. Like they know that like indebting their country in the future will be worse, but but people are starving today. And that's the trap, right? That's the debt trap, right? And it's so, so tragic. And, you know, I think Bitcoin, I'm hoping it's a little gradual. Like I'm hoping that it takes like a couple decades essentially, uh, or maybe a decade or whatever for this to sort of start to unwind and people start to onboard. Because I mean, if it happens overnight, I mean, wow, like it could be it could be catastrophic. But I've had a lot of people who have a lot of experience in debt tell me that it'll it probably I'm probably being optimistic, and it'll probably be pretty sudden whenever this thing does start to collapse. So man, I just hope we educate as many people as possible about Bitcoin before then. I hope so too. All right. Um, Edward has a question for you. Hi, Alex. Hi, Edward. Thank you for your work and for your research. It's really, really good and sad at the same time. Uh, my question was, um, what kind of feedback, feedback did you get after your recent article um, about the DMF and the World Bank? I'd like to know. Uh, a lot of feedback. Um, what was, so I did actually get into some conversations with some people who work at these institutions. And of course, like they're, what was interesting is that they initially, they're, they, they deny, they, you know, you know, use ad hominems and they try to defame me in some way. Um, but then um, what's what's exposed when you start to talk to them is that they don't actually know what their organizations do. So we have this banality of evil thing where like, I think the average bureaucrat at these institutions signs up because it's, well, first of all, it's very well paid. I mean, we didn't even touch on that, but these institutions are, come with a lot of benefits. It's very well paid, et cetera. But, but they, I think they like want to make a difference in the world. Like I think that they want most of these lower to mid-level bureaucrats, like they want to do well. And they're led to believe that the bank and the fund do well. I mean, they, for long stints, they post this giant poster outside their headquarters in DC that says end poverty. Like they, they think that they're doing something. The, the tragedy, of course, is they're doing the opposite. They're, they're prolonging poverty through their policies. But I think like these people start to realize that, that something's missing or something's wrong. Like I had one guy I was arguing with about because I talk about Bangladesh in my piece and my shrimp farming that the World Bank has done there. And he was like, no, we haven't made any loans to that. And I'm like, you might want to check your data, buddy. Uh, and I like showed him and he's like, oh. So I, I think that it, it's just, it's been so vast. And the number of projects that these country, that these institutions have funded has been so many and it's been so many decades that like you can easily not know the history of the organization when you sign up for it. So that was one interesting thing. But I mean, generally speaking, I've been definitely, um, I'm happy with the amount of people who've reached out. I mean, especially people from developing countries like seem to be grateful that someone's saying this. Um, I made a talk at the Africa Bitcoin conference in Ghana around this, which it should be out on the internet soon. But I remember this one woman that came up to me after older woman, she's probably in her sixties. And she was just like, thank you for saying that. And then she turned away and walked away. <laughs> and I, I think that's, um, that's the thing is like, so few, like people understand this in their bones, that this is what's happening. It's kind of con like, the, like people rant and rave about it on, uh, again, like socialist kind of leftist, um, you know, texts, but like, it's not really, um, often looked at super seriously, which is why I was really happy that Safe wrote about it uh, in his book. And yeah, it's just, there's not a whole lot of discourse on this topic. Uh, it's strange. It is, it is, it is a little strange, but um, the feedback has been very powerful. So I'm going to turn it into a book. It'll come out in a few, maybe Q2. And uh, I know it's been translated into a few languages so far. So yeah, I've been happy about what's with the feedback so far. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Dirk, you got a question? Yeah, great article. I, I really enjoyed it, and it was very educational. And in and, and, and parts, actually, shocking. Really, what what has been inflicted on on the world and how we explore uh, exploit it. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the adoption of Bitcoin in Africa, in particular Nigeria, where they're trying to push for the 
adoption or force the adoption, I think, try push at least for the adoption of the e-Naira. I think that is an, mm-hmm. is an interesting project, what they try to achieve. And I think Nigeria is, is certainly uh, very visible in, in all of Africa due to their um, power in, in, within Africa. Yeah, c- certainly. Nigeria being the largest country in Africa, um, often referred to as the United States of Africa, all eyes are on Nigeria. Um, so when I was at the Bitcoin conference in Ghana, um, I, I think you know you, you start to see that it's sort of a, a story of, it's got like kind of two narratives. There's just two tales here. One is that there is this remarkable Bitcoin adoption in Africa, like jaw-dropping. Like I met people in Somalia, Cameroon, uh, Kenyan refugee camps, like who had come to this conference, who are building Bitcoin communities all across the continent. It is, I mean, people would not believe the the extent to which communities and entrepreneurs are using Bitcoin. However, and I know that people in Turkey, Argentina, Lebanon, etc., probably understand this. It, it is also the sad case that you know there are way more people shilling random crypto tokens and you know using stable coins and stuff like that. So. It is a, it is a little tricky because the you know and it's it varies. Certain countries are different depending on their context. But man, you get a lot of people just like doing trading, you know, trading crap coins, and this is the reality. And and those companies have a lot of budget to do marketing. So you go to a, a country like Nigeria. I mean, there you know, FTX had a school program there. They were like poaching people from universities to work for them. It was crazy. So, I mean, in Binance is just so so powerful in these countries, and they have no interest in people self custodying their Bitcoin. So they actually impose like a flat fee in some countries of like that's significant to withdraw Bitcoin. So you know, it's a little it's 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 you know it's a great picture because on the one hand, these crypto industries are are rotten at the core and self interested and they're not helping people on board really to Bitcoin. But on the other hand, they are providing financial services to places where the local fiat system is totally destroyed. So I think it's it's something you need to kind of be even handed about. So that's that's the tricky part of it. But man, the inspiring part is like the big the Bitcoin communities and the Bitcoin adoption is it's for real. It's happening uh, and it's happening at a pace that's um that's really extraordinary. So thank you. Max. Um yeah, hi Alex. Um, I have a question uh, regarding CBDCs because now nowadays we see like a lot of countries experimenting and trying to implement more and more. So I'm curious what problems you see from a human rights perspective that might be occurring when yeah we have widespread CBDCs adoptions. Well, Nigeria is an interesting case because they're one of the countries that's furthest along their, I guess, development of and implementation of this project. And they just, so they have a massive public sector and they just uh, passed a law the other day, basically making it illegal for any government employee to withdraw cash. So they're they're like um, trying to expedite this transition to a cashless society in a pretty like kind of vicious way. And, it, you know, kind of maybe predictably, it's causing a massive uh, adoption of, of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency as like a reaction to that. Uh, young people know better. But I, I don't know. I think it's going to be quite uneven. I, I think that we all know that all these governments want to see BDC for the way it can increase their monetary power, like the ability for them just to like pick a sector of the population. And if there's a protest in the auto industry, they can just zap credits into those people's accounts and try to get them to chill out. Like that's what the Chinese are essentially doing. They can impose caloric restrictions. I mean, they could do anything. So there's obviously like really big reasons for these um, governments to want a, a bigger role for the state in private electronic money, an area that's currently dominated by tech companies and financial companies. It's like they, they, they clearly want more of it. That's that's what I believe the Chinese project is all about. It is about taking power back from some of these big tech companies that, that the CCP believes just sort of got too much power. But the thing is, like, even in a country like America, where we have some state run services, like we know that going to like the DMV to get a license is like the worst possible experience. So, I mean, what's really going to happen when these like you know, if the, if the government has to actually provide like retail services, like I, I I don't know, I'd be suspicious. So I think these projects are going to proceed. I think they're going to try to be forced on populations. I think people are going to reject them to some extent. But uh, you know, it's the great unknown. Um, all I know is that they are a giant advertisement for Bitcoin. Uh, that's for sure. So so they may end up being part of their own undoing. We'll see. Uh, Thomas. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm not sure if you have an answer for this. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm from Lebanon and something is happening here is that it's been like two years where there has been negotiations with the IMF to get money, to get loans. And it's been failing with the politicians. So basically, um, the population here is blaming their politicians for not um, getting that money of, from the IMF. Right. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, basically, like, what do you think of the idea is that also the populations of these countries, the so-called third world countries, their acceptance of all these aids and uh, loans from the IMF, and why do you think um, there's this huge trust in these organizations, even though like we there's a huge track record of them not providing or of these loans uh, ending up not not serving the population in general? Well, we I mean we touched on it before, but like yeah, if your country is collapsing, an influx of cash today can save people today, even if it's inefficient and even if it's being siphon you know twenty percent is being siphoned off the top, like like. There's appeal to that. And I think the average citizen probably, you know, looks around and says we could use it. So that's the danger is that like people are, you know, they, they, they may want uh, the infusion. Um, the, the, the thing with the politicians is that, and I don't know, I'm sure that you and Safer are more knowledgeable about what's happening there, but like historically, you know, the politicians, which, 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 which need to be elected in some way are typically pretty wary of these IMF uh, of accepting the money because then they have to impose these um, adjustment policies on the population, which are really unpopular. So my sense is that's probably what they're debating because if they go in to Lebanon and they, you guys get the money, but all of a sudden, like the government cuts massive amounts of subsidies, like there's going to be riots and protests and people are going to get overthrown. So I, I would imagine that that's what the debate is, but I don't know, Steve, what's your, what's your insight into that? Is I think that, that is a part of it, uh, but I think in, in, in Lebanon, the situation is more complicated because of, mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, it's always more complicated than just the economics because of the geopolitical aspect of it. So uh, the Lebanese government, uh, while well, the last Lebanese government was not very uh, friendly to the U.S., it was not on the U.S.'s good side, and that makes these things more complicated. So the, there's that angle, which is also very important. So um, uh, f from the economic aspect, because they've been, in a sense, I mean, maybe we, it's it's going to be a little weird to end this on a kind of trying to maybe perhaps say something positive about the IMF, but because uh, in the Lebanese uh, government has been kind of alienated from the U.S. centric institutions, they've been able to go for decades where the bureaucracy has just become enormously inefficient and enormously wasteful. So if they had been having to renegotiate with the IMF every five, six, seven years, which is the case for your average dysfunctional, say, um, Latin American borrower usually, then every time they do something like this, there's going to be some kind of adjustment. And that would perhaps affect, to some extent, public sector workers. And here, I think the problem in Lebanon is mainly public sector workers. Their salaries are the uh, big problem. So that thing has grown for 30 years now, since the end of the war. Uh, public sector workers' salaries have just continued to grow. And uh, in fact, you know, the recent collapse was triggered by that. When this outgoing president came into power, he signed an uh, increase in the wages of uh, public sector workers, also in, with retrospective uh, effects. So they paid people more for the time that uh, for, for past time. So it's a huge increase in government spending um, as soon as it came into power. And then eventually the, the, the giant banking Ponzi uh, unraveled. I mean, to be clear, it wasn't the increase in the salaries that caused the Ponzi to be to be there. The Ponzi was always there, like it is in yeah. every other country. But this is what tipped the Ponzi over um, into falling apart. But at this point, I think there's just an enormous amount of bloat in the public bureaucracy. So the, the, there's, uh, I think it is something around a third of all workers in the country work for the public sector. And there's no prospect for any kind of uh, resolution with the IMF anytime well, soon. Well, the IMF might say you have to bring that down. And then those guys are sitting there saying, shit, if we do that, we're going to get overthrown. I guess that's the ongoing 
debate that you see. Sometimes. Sort of, yes, yeah. I think that is an aspect of it, but it's it's not as simple as that because you know the IMF is right. not even interested because of other geopolitical considerations. So I think what's happening de facto now is that. Uh, the, the, there's no more juice to squeeze in the orange of the Lebanese lira. The, the, yeah. the money that is in the national currency has been completely destroyed. Anybody who has any money in it, it's now worth practically nothing. And so yeah. there's not much that they're gaining from inflation. They're constantly giving raises to the public sector employees. But these raises don't matter because the, the, the more raises they announce, the faster the currency collapses in price particularly for the goods that are sensitive, so that are price sensitive, which people are after. And then they, of course, they also have limits on how much you can withdraw from your bank. Yeah. So even if they give them a raise, effectively in dollar terms, they're not, the, the, the government no longer has the ability to give raises in dollars because they can't print dollars and they're running out of dollars and they can't squeeze the economy anymore because people are not using the local currency. So, I mean, we're getting a lot more um, effective, if you want, public sector reform than anything that the IMF would ever suggest because our public sector workers have gotten something like a 90% pay cut. Um, even with all the raises taking place, they're, getting, they're still getting 80 to 90% of a pay cut compared to what they would be getting. And so if they formalized the, uh, the, the exchange rate at uh, where it is right now, then I think they, the Lebanese government is suddenly in a very <laughs> sustainable fiscal position because they've just dropped all their expenditures by 80%, but their tax yeah. revenue is going to continue to rise along with prices because taxes are denominated in the um, price in liras. So they'd become very sustainable, but obviously that's going to be very unpopular. So it seems like by not having the IMF, perhaps what's going to happen is just that the currency is going to collapse and the economy is going to de facto dollarize. And then public sector reform is just going to happen because the people in the public sector who are uh, getting paid very, very little money from the public sector are just going to have to get actual jobs uh, in the market in order to get dollars or in order to get paid, at least even in liras, but you know something that is acceptable, they're going to need to work for somebody other than the state. This is kind of where it's... Um, where it seems like it is going now, yeah. but I mean, I don't know. It it, it, it could get much worse, obviously, because yeah. uh, the, to to answer and maybe the last que question here, um, sort of a concluding question or discussion point is, uh, you know, well, what do we do? Uh, what was interesting is you read the writings of the folks who who knew who figured this out, regardless of their ideology, who kind of figured out the Ponzi, who figured out the debt trap whether they were writing in the early 70s or 80s or 90s they like saw it for what it was and then like they the problem was they didn't have like any sort of way to make a difference there was no tool for which they could actually change and and their many cases they ended up becoming leftists or whatever because they they thought that the answer was to nationalize power away from the IMF and the west and and to have local you know, to bring the power back to the people was what they were thinking in their mind. But to me, that never made any sense because all these countries were ruled by dictators. So like you were just going to go back to um, a local person controlling everything. And, and I, you know, that never made a lot of sense to me. So their their solutions were always like really poor uh, and, and you know, not honoring actually the quality of sometimes their analysis was quite good. So, you know, it, it was always the sad thing of reading these people with these incisive reports on uh, what was happening with the IMF. And then at the end of their book or whatever, they would, you know, say, uh, you know, we need to, uh, you know, create a coalition to push back. And it would be, there'd be these conferences at like Arusha or whatever, where a bunch of folks from poor countries would get together and, you know, they, they they're coherent. Look, they wanted to abolish the debt, and I think there's a. I'm I'm actually very supportive of uh, canceling what is known as odious debt or debt that was borrowed without the consent of the population. I think there's a legal precedent for that in the United States that goes back to the Spanish American War. It's just the IMF and World Bank have never followed that legal precedent, so they they never allow the cancellation of debt that was incurred by colonialists or dictators. It's never been allowed. You know, short of that, which has never been effective, like there were massive protests in the 90s. I think this the problems with the IMF and World Bank were much more salient in the public discourse in the 90s, even in the halls of Congress. People are debating it for different reasons. I mean, Republicans in the United States always thought it was a waste of money. People on the left thought it was exploitation, whatever, whatever. It never got anywhere. Like we never actually, I mean, there were surface 
surface level reforms at these institutions, but they continue to do the same thing. Like, you know, now for the tiniest, poorest countries, which of course constitute a tiny percentage of the balance sheet of the IMF World Bank, there's uh, there's um, interest free loans, right? Um, for these, what are they, what they call them, HIPCs or highly indebted poor countries. But they, but in order to get the loan, you still have to do structural adjustment. So you're still like you know, part of the part of the game. So, I, you know, there's really never any core reform here. And that's why, you know, I think the Bitcoin thing is gives me optimism is we finally have at least something that that individuals can turn to anywhere in the world and that maybe can change the system. I think before Bitcoin, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, as Safe was saying, like your your hope was basically trying to convince governments to to do something with gold. And I just, I, that, that seems like that's not going to happen, um, uh, at least in a public way. Uh, we'll see. I mean, this decade is going to be interesting, but um, I'm optimistic that at least people have a, a shield to defend themselves now. Yeah, I think uh, it, it's very astute to draw analogy with what is happening now, because we've also gone through, similar to the 1970s, the past 10 years, where a massive a low interest rate, a highly inflationary credit binge where everybody in the world was borrowing at very low interest rates. And now is the hangover time where uh, the uh, interest rates are rising. So I remember the trigger for the debt crisis of the 1980s was the monetary policy decisions of Paul Volcker in the early 1980s, who raised interest rates up to uh, something like 18 or 20% at that time, which are almost unthinkable rates today. <laughs> But they were what um, stopped the growth of credit because throughout the 70s, there was just very easy lending everywhere and everybody was drowning in debt. But also what's more severe going from, let's say eight or 9% to 18, which is what he did, or, or going from 03 to five, four or 5%. Like they're both pretty se severe, right? Like in terms of- uh, Yeah, the yeah absolutely. And of course, it's it's not just simply the interest rate because there are a lot of other operations of the central bank that weigh in like quantitative easing and so on. But yeah, I think now we're getting into the point where the credit is going to become much harder to come by. And um, as interest rates rise, the fiscal position of most of these indebted countries is going to become more and more untenable. And I think the next few years are going to be terrible in that regard. And this, uh, you know, you cannot separate that from all of the talk about our great reset and all of these uh, grand remaking of the world ideas. A big part of that is, you know, it's, it, it's the 21st century version of the uh, 1980s. Yeah. No, and remember who, remember who pays the cost. Like these things aren't free. Like who pays the cost are the majority of the world's population, uh, the majority of the people in, 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 in the, well, in the global south, who make up eighty percent of the population, and you know whatever eighty to ninety percent of the people in those countries constitute sixty to seventy percent of the world population. And again, they're like over the next few years, unless things really change, like the amount of time they have to work, forget currency and currency rates, like the amount of time they have to work to get a thousand calories of this or that is going to go up. Like that, that's going to cause enormous uh, pressure, starvation. Uh, living standards are going to go down and over time life expectancy goes down i mean that, that that's that's the cost i mean the cost of the system is you know physical harm to the majority of the world's people i mean that that's really what would never be said in you know polite society but that's that's the cost of our system absolutely and it is um it's it's a very depressing note on which to end but uh sorry for that <laughs> but but it been, but also a lot of people say you know, they're like, well, what do we do? Right. Well, I think knowledge is the first step, like especially like obviously you're several of you here from Lebanon or the Middle East, like, you know, I mean, this is something you just know natively from living. But people in the West and Europe and America, especially like we could do with a good dose of just knowing this. And then and then that helps. I mean, knowledge is the first step. So, you know, if more and more people in the world understood this, then. Uh, things, things, there would be some changes. Like you wouldn't be so quick to like get a job at the, um, the World Bank if you knew what it actually did, right? So, um, I don't know. I think I think that their knowledge is important. It's not it's not sufficient, but I think it's necessary. So, let's start there, and then and then we have Bitcoin as our tool, and we can work from there. So, I, I don't want to be too depressed. I, I do think there's there's some optimism for the for the future for sure. But um, hey, thanks so much for having me. It's been really fun. Care. Cheers. Take care.